Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 156, Breakfast for Dinner. Sunday brunch on Wednesday evening. We're both here as always. Can you tell who's who? There'll be a quiz at the end of the show. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, so we're in the midst of the yearly holiday sale madness, and I didn't really have time to prep a full episode or write up a review. So what we decided to do this week is steal our usual unscripted Sunday brunch format and use it on a Wednesday night. So tonight, expect some unscripted discussion on geek and gaming topics. No review tonight, but I did get in some game plays last Friday before everything went a little crazy, and we will be talking about them in the Bellhops Tabletop segment. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folks, both positive and negative. First up, some comments on our Magistra of Alchemy hero set for the Aventuria unboxing. Andre Thanhauser writes, The Alchemy hero is actually one of my four favorite characters from all the 15 which exist so far. 15? Wow, we have some boxes to open still. (laughs) Indeed. (laughs) Interesting that my other three favorites are all from the base set. Maybe that's not that absurd, as all the four base characters mechanically show extremes, while all the other characters, mostly mechanically, are just some twists. Concerning the theme, it's quite the opposite. While the base characters are very generic, a lot of the newer ones are very special. Nevertheless, the Alchemist is a great combination of light to medium spells and missile weapons on top of the various potions and other equipment. Not that the Pomegranate is a weapon, but a red card is a direct one-time use, which makes sense for a grenade. And Eric Simon writes, Definitely my fave of the new heroes. I will be curious to hear what you think. Yeah, so the pomegranate is a reference to when I was doing the unboxing. I saw this one card and I'm like, oh my god, that seems ridiculous. Well, at the time, I probably didn't notice it was a red card. I would have to assume when we're playing, we're pretty used to watching for that and I would have caught that. So it's not... Over the top for a red card is pretty actually normal for Adventuria. Well, thanks, Andre and Eric, for both of those comments. Um, So far, I have not tried out the new character yet, though it is the on deck. But first, we need to go back and actually finish Forest of No Return and win, because as I mentioned in the review, we failed. And we still haven't decided if we're going to cheat and continue where we failed or if we're going to go back to the beginning. But we do still have to do it to actually officially finish that one off as complete. Now, hearing the praise for this alchemist, though, I actually have me wondering, and I'm kind of excited to try this new hero. Maybe we should play through the Magistra of Alchemy first, and then go through Forest No Return using that character. That might be worth doing, because then I get an extra try besides just one short one. So that might be what we might do, and use the new hero in Forest of No Return. I hate giving up Arbosh, my dwarf. <laughs> Well, speaking of Forest of No Return, Martin Voss commented on our review to say the Forest of No Return sounds like the second big adventure for ODM, the Dutch Dutch translation of DSA, that this card game is also based on. Nice to see they're sticking to the classic names. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Sometime in the past, we were told that all of these adventure adventures are actually based on classic Dark Eye adventures, so that makes perfect sense. But I do wonder what ODM stands for in Dutch, because I know it's it's the Dark Eye here. Now I forget. Dar Swartz Og? Is that what we had learned? We had, we had figured out how to pronounce it, but it's been three weeks. Yeah, no, I, 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 I it's Og. Og? Og? Das Swartz Og? I think, Og? I think it's Og. Og. Well, Swartz, I know I was doing wrong too. It's not just Swaz. It's like Swars. <laughs> Swars Og, I think. Yeah, I. I Swars Og? I that think night I had Google, Google Translate up, but it's. Yeah, yeah, my bad. But I'm wondering, in Dutch, I'm sure we couldn't pronounce that either. But oh, I just no. wonder, ODM <laughs> in some way means the dark eye or the lidless eye, maybe. Well, next, a comment on our surprisingly popular White Star Galaxy Edition review on YouTube. Uh, Jay Villanueva commented, I just subscribed to your channel. And thank you for this video. It was really informative. I bought the book, and I'm a first-time player slash rep. Do you have a video explaining the basics? Well, thanks for the sub, Jay. That's always appreciated. Unfortunately, I don't have any other White Star videos up. Um, Now, the thing is, White Star is based on white box 
which is based on original Dungeons and Dragons, OD&D as people like to call it, the original printing of Dungeons and Dragons. And there are lots of other content creators out there that have produced intro to OD&D stuff. If you just look at the Gygax D&D, original D&D or basic D&D and look for a guide to how to get started in that or info on that, you sh that should be able to help you. It is not something we personally have covered here. Finally, I want to uh, highlight some of the comments on our Guild of Dungeoneering review and giveaway. Uh, Todd Mulholland says, this is a fun game with a great sense of humor and wonderful voice acting on behalf of the narrator. Uh, the narrator is one I've always referred to as the bard during the, yes. uh, the reviews. Uh, Brand Stoddard adds, I had a great time with this game. And Chris Groff writes, this is a great game for sure. Put lots of time into this. I am very glad to hear people are actually digging this game quite a bit. It actually makes me really glad that we're featuring this and agreed to work with them in the first place. Um, I always wonder if people are going to actually care about non-tabletop content from us. And I'm really glad to see, at least in this case, I think we are on point. I think it's close enough to tabletop. It's tabletop adjacent enough that people are digging it. So speaking of the Guild of Engineering, let's head over to the announcement. Some reminders before we move on to the rest of the show. Now, as noted in the last segment, we are currently hosting a giveaway for two Steam codes for the Guild of Dungeoneering Ultimate Edition, which features all of the Guild of Dungeoneering content that has been released, all the DLC and everything in one big package. There are a lot of fans of this dungeon crawling, tile placement, deck building roguelike, including Mo and I. Head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com to enter. Also, thank you, Kevin, for reminding me I didn't reward those of you who joined us live here last week with a bonus code. I promised him I'd make sure to do that tonight, so check the chat room for that code. And finally... Voting is still open in the RPG Geek 24-hour RPG contest, which I'm taking part in for the first time in nine years. Yes, I actually wrote a new game. Head over to the RPG Geek forums to download the 12 entries and get back to Rob with six Bs with your vote. Find links to the entries and how to vote in the show notes. Don't worry, we'll put links on the for, for the forum page, the zip file, Rob's link, all of that will be in the show notes. We're normally here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. So this week, though, we are taking a break. With all the holiday tabletop game sales hitting this week, we didn't actually have time to really do any research required to properly answer a game night question. Yes, we actually do research when we get your questions. So instead, we decided to turn this segment into an unscripted discussion of anything gaming or geeky. And I do welcome the chat to get involved as well, consider it an AMA, or if there's something you want to talk about, or feel free share your impressions of anything we bring up tonight absolutely there is uh this we actually missed our normal sunday brunch yes. so in, to some degree this is uh a replacement for that although we aren't going to go through and do the list of games no. from spiel this this one that will just uh put all of our listeners to sleep and generally involves a lot more screen sharing than yes. we do for our podcast episode uh, for those of you who do like that kind of content, though, again, we do do that every Sunday now, whenever possible, uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern, where there is a uh, chat with the uh, lobby and screen sharing of games and talking about all the hotness or not hotness or fun or, or whatever. not hotness <laughs> or, or dumb bags that shouldn't exist because ripping off people through your Kickstarter because they think they're getting something cool. You can't get cheaper elsewhere. That was a thing. Um, that though is not here on Twitch. That is over on YouTube. We are doing that show on YouTube, uh, just to see if we get a different audience, get different groups of people, make the YouTube algorithm happy. So our other videos get views, whatever, trying out something a little different over there. So the Sunday brunch, normally you can find Sunday afternoons, 1 PM on YouTube, which I think is YouTube slash tabletop fell off. It I'm is. assuming that's probably what it is. Yep. <laughs> I don't usually type, excuse me. I don't usually type that one in. Yeah, no, we've got more than enough folks to be able to get our own custom, uh, custom URL, link after the. Yes, uh, thank you for that. And we're always looking for subs, so subs and follows and likes; those are always good things for us. All right. Well, what do you have on the topic tonight? Starting All right, off, so I want to talk a bit about uh, geeky TV. So 
one thing I wanted to ask Sean about because last week, I think it was mainly during the after show, it was a coffee break. I was talking about Another Life, a um, sci fi teen romance, kind of hard sci fi. Uh, Katie Sackoff, I don't want to use that term because we're not explicit. Um, <laughs> Katie Sackoff Love Fest, I think we'll just say. And I know you've started it. Did you I finished it. On it oh, I blew I oh, you finished it. Burned through it. Yeah um but like i said it's like it's like it's terrible but you keep watching because you want to know where it's going yeah i mean I, to be honest i will admit that i really enjoy katie sackoff i really do she's a fun actress i don't think she's a great actress but she's really <laughs> i was fun. gonna say I'm she's like... really fun to watch and it's very clear that she was deeply involved in this show it is a very much highlight katie sackoff show um and and i'm okay with that uh there were some other fun characters in there as well mm. i know actually one of the ones you hated i actually enjoyed okay. um the 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 mean mean girl the mean um, girl yeah, yeah the yeah. mean girl drove me nuts oh see i, and I see i was enjoying it I, she didn't last very long no, um spoilers <laughs> the, only uh, slight i don't think we're gonna give away like the whole plot or anything no 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 and it, it is greenlit for another season as far as i know oh it is i was wondering it's well it's because they definitely, definitely not wrapped canceled. it up it's definitely not canceled. Yeah. But they definitely finished the story as opposed to the difference from season one to season two. Mm -hmm. Even though like they there was a huge Chekhov's gun at the end of season two. <laughs> like like the a huge big ship sized Chekhov's yeah, gun that they just never really did anything with. Yeah, it's it's an odd show. Um it's not great TV, but it's good binge worthy TV. So if you've got, you know, twenty episodes worth of time. Yeah. There you go. It's absolutely worth doing, especially if, like myself, you're a fan of Katie Sackhoff and Starbuck. And, and there, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of Starbuck in it, sort of, really. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what you just called it. Everyone loves Starbuck. That's, that's the sitcom version. What did yeah. you think of the science in it? Because I thought they were at least trying. Uh, they were trying. Um, it, it seemed more realistic than many other sci-fi shows that just, like, throw everything to the wind. Like, I, yeah, I found, there's guns and blasters yeah. and, and thrusters and star fights. And... They kept it pretty minimal. I mean, they, they tried to, in many ways, avoid the science. Um, mm. I mean, they're, I think they, they went overboard more than anything with their whole concept of AI. Uh, the, oh, AI yeah, the, the, the AI issues the are is AI. pretty, that's questionable. Uh, the space stuff, yeah, no, that's fine. I didn't really have any huge problems. Uh, I, I liked their, their warp concepts at least um you know the bubbling concept is, yeah. is pretty uh, prevalent not possible necessarily but at least if everyone everyone sort of figures oh well if we could generate enough energy to to do this bubble thing it'd be a great way to do it uh i i, I commented to you at one point the overuse of one particular room on the ship oh yeah oh my god like is i that don't know if that was like the, the only room they had to film in and but what's really confusing to me is there were a couple of times where they were in that room, but it was green screen, like yeah. they they very clearly weren't in that room, even though other times they were. Um, so they had a set piece for that room that they worked in, and then I, I don't know maybe if, if, if they had a problem, they got the set got flooded or something because all of a sudden <laughs> well, they did point, blow it up a few times. Maybe uh, one of those they actually filmed blowing. Yeah, up. I don't know because at one point it was just like, why are they? very clearly green screened in on this room that they use every single episode yes it it it, it was more overused in the holodeck yes it, it's yes there was but uh no i absolutely it was fun all right the other one i i feel i have to talk about because we just watched this last night so it's like hitting nine o'clock at night last night and um during, i planned on taking a break we're like we're gonna take a couple hours off and then get back to it so I had actually gone to Shoppers Drug Mart and we had talked about smart food a lot a couple episodes ago and I was craving smart food. I actually was even more craving Doritos, but the price on the Doritos compared to the price on get two for whatever for the smart food, I couldn't get the Doritos. So I got a couple bags of smart food and we sat down and watched Wonder Woman 84. So thank you, uh, May, for lending us that. I'm not sure if you actually want it back or not. And I, I realize I, I think the 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 statute of limitations is out on this one. Like it's been out long enough that we can probably <laughs> talk about this. But what the heck was that movie? It was horrible, like, utterly what, horrible. What was that? Garbage. What, what did I watch? Just utter garbage. I and it it's made part of the problem with Wonder Woman eighty four 
is that Wonder Woman itself, the original, was a really strong yeah. DC movie. Yeah, it was good. I mean, Wonder, like, it, it wasn't without its problems. I mean, it's not perfect, but oh, it was a really... May hasn't movie. seen it. Oops. <laughs> um, you know, again, it was a really good movie. And then they went and made Wonder Woman 84. And the number of problems <sighs> in that movie... I. What I was the entire stopped. opening scene doing? I, what was I, that for? The... I don't know anything about that movie. Why none of it makes sense? It's not. There's there's horrible characterizations. There's horrible animation. There's horrible store plot lines. Like, oh my gosh! Like I just like I had heard it was bad. I was expecting bad. I wasn't expecting so bad. It's good, but it still like blew away my expectations for just how bad the the I, the, the spawns cape lasso that could do everything. The um. The, the the villain just uh, gross um what was the other one that well, the, the 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 80s when they first showed the 80s i'm like okay you can do a period piece right or you can do a period parody why was this a parody yeah like why was it a parody of the 80s why why wasn't like a period piece that was not a period piece that was ha ha look how dumb people looked in the 80s look at the stupid cars they drove oh look at the stupid places they hung out like what was that? Yeah, and as and someone then, who grew up in the eighties, I was like insulting. I'm like, this is. The they wore. Yeah, look at the stupid clothes they wore. Look at the dumb ways they talk. Except they only used one scene where they highlighted the lingo, and then they yeah. dropped it for the rest of the movie. And I mean, let's do we do we need to talk about what happened to the guy? Mm-hmm. I know, right? <laughs> Plus, like, why even sub the actor? Like, like, why? What? You, that was just creepy. And yes. The, yeah. <laughs> the, the the guy that suddenly wore the clothes that she dressed Chris Pine in and a that he didn't buy like the total plot hole. Oh, just yes, I mean, what? yeah. There, there, I mean, there's some real ethical. No remorse where you just took over some no. dude's life. Yeah. There's no some remorse. serious ethical problems in there. Yes, Wonder uh, Woman had no problem with that. Yeah. Uh, and then and then I mean the 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 flight the 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 airplane oh. the the jet plane. I, the jet plane didn't bug me just because I was I knew there was an invisible plane scene and I'm like okay. Oh, but even before the invisible plane part, okay. But what museum leaves a fully fueled away? jet jet fighter sitting on the yes, airfield? Uh, yeah, and and dude who flies World War One planes who knows instantly. Yeah, after flipping a couple switches, how to right. fly an F-14. Yeah, yeah. You know, because jet engines are exactly they're all the same, same right? Exactly. Oh, there there was so many. Just just we just kept watching. We're like, what? Why? What? What? Yeah, no, it was it was bad. And then oh. and then the wings and and the yeah, I don't yeah, it whatever. Just, it, 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 the, the only good scene in that was the post credit scene. That was, that was the only thing good in the entire movie was the post credit scene. Yeah, I, and I mean, I'm yeah, the and like like and I gotta say, um, I'm drawing a blank on her. Gal Gadot, I think, did a fantastic job acting with what she was given with. Chris Absolutely. Pine was cringy, but I think Chris Pine's kind of always cringy. Yeah, he like he Chris Pine plays a good Kirk for a reason. <laughs> like it's just kind of yeah. he's kind of hammy, right? Yeah, no, Which that's worked fair. for Kirk. Did not work for this. And and yeah, I mean, not, there was nothing wrong with what Gal did. She's still a fantastic Wonder Woman. Yeah, but I thought she was Wonder a great Woman. Wonder should Woman. be able to do what these things that she's doing, be doing. uh there you know there's all that and then the, the look, mall fight i'm like is this a kid's movie like it felt like oh. watching gremlins or goonies yeah and i'm like and with the parody at the beginning the bright colors i'm like oh, watching a kid's movie now and i then, get it it's a kid's movie but then it kept getting darker and darker towards yeah. the end and the whole characterization of cheetah yeah and and the whole like oh she's smart and she's nerdy so she like well no, yeah, the, the 80s thing it was the 80s thing where she's yeah. got super ugly hair and wears big glasses and then suddenly she gets a perm and her glasses are off yeah and she's hip and cool and hot now she's all that the in wonder woman uh, form yeah it's it's and like oh she can't walk in heels well lots of people can't walk well, that in was heels. the like, superpower right that was <laughs> like, the superpower i thought she was stealing the powers from wonder woman i that was a plot twist i actually i i misread I thought she was taking the powers from from Wonder Woman, and the first power she gains is the power to walk in heels. <laughs> yeah, that, that is that is the deciding factor as a if, as your life as a woman. If you learn to walk in heels, you are an effective woman. Yeah, it was it, even it was, the beginning, like the beginning with the kid. They give her this huge lesson on truth, which yes, okay, they kind of had that come back at the end. The kid never lied. Was that there, there a cut scene where the kid lies that she has to learn a lesson about truth? Yeah, it's, like, it's, like there's got to be. 
because the kid took a shortcut at one point but didn't lie about it and i'm, and I'm con- like and i'm confused because like everyone rightfully praised patty jenkins for the first movie it was fantastic yeah. and yet she is as far as i'm aware wrote this second one her and, name and was on it she, i don't know how you know much she was she, she definitely directed it uh and she wrote it with two other people um but like did she get stomped on did she not have the full ability to control and control because again she did such a fantastic movie and such a brilliant heroic representation of wonder woman that was powerful and empowering Mm -hmm. until (laughs) until 1984 yeah um yeah again there you know it's i'm not saying that the first wonder woman movie was perfect uh, but no, but it was it, it, it was my favorite of all the modern DC yeah, movies. Absolutely. And then they go and make this as a follow up. Yeah. Oh my like, <laughs> wow. I like I expected that. I was not expecting that bad. Like I am just still baffled. Yeah. It, I'm like, I'm gonna go watch the deleted scenes, maybe it'll make sense. Do we need the Schneider cut? Is that the problem? <laughs> I I need the it was already like three hours long, too. That was the other problem. It was supposed to be the short break, and it wasn't much of a short break. Yeah, 151 minutes uh, running time on that. So it's not it's, uh, not it's quick. Not a short movie, not quick. Yeah, and pacing, I mean, and pacing was quick too. But yeah, yeah. So that that there is our our Wonder Woman eighty four rant. <laughs> I'm kind of glad to see Sean agreed because oh yeah, 100%. I was slightly concerned I'd bring it up and he'd be like, eh, there was some good. I'm oh like, no, oh. no, no, <laughs> no good, no good at all. No, I we, we, that was shockingly <laughs> bad. Um, here's an amusing one that I, I got D into Narcos. So, so I'm watching Narcos Mexico, the, the latest season, which is just as good as the, the previous seasons. And she's come down a couple times when it's been on. So, and I'm like, no, no, watch this. It's actually pretty good. And she's like, yeah, okay. You're right. Yep. You're right. You can keep watching it without me, but you're right. If I'm not going to mind if you leave this on. So I got her hooked on Narcos. So yeah, it, no. it, it's still very interesting seeing. So there's a bunch of different series that were set at the same time, like based on the same historic event, right? So there was Narcos, and then there was Narcos Mexico, and they're all by the same people. They're both Netflix, right? And they integrate. They have actors overlap. But at the same time, a Netflix also produced um, El Chapo, which is a character from the, well, character, a person, a real person from the real time period. They also produced a show called Alias JJ, and then there was Pablo Escobar something de mal. And then there's another show on El Chapo. Well, the interesting thing is only Narcos is an American show about the drug cartels in Colombia and America. The other ones were all Mexican shows. And okay. the difference in perspective is fascinating. <laughs> now, I'm not saying everyone deep dive it as much as I necessarily did, but I am really loving seeing this season's look at El Chapo compared to the show that was called El Chapo. Right. And because El Chapo is told from the Mexican point of view, whereas this is told from the American point of view. And sure enough, the DEA kind of solves and, and, and manipulates everything. They're kind of behind the scenes everywhere. Whereas we watch the Mexican one, like one of the shows didn't even mention the DEA were even involved. Okay. They were just kind of like, yeah, yeah, there, there's DEA people here. <laughs> whereas the American show is all about, you know, the DEA undercover agents and what they're doing to, and how they're yeah. manipulating things. Still yeah. strongly recommended though. Um, And what Deanna's actually, one of the things that we noted was the striking difference in the action scenes in that compared to everything else we've watched recently. So that was something we were talking about, I think, on an after show or a Sunday, how over the top, whereas this possibly is more realistic, but at least feels more realistic, where it's a lot of people running and shooting and clapping sounds with nothing exploding (laughs) and, and people ducking for cover and you know cars getting bullet holes in them as opposed to you know big explosions and people getting shot in places but still fighting on and these are all you know one hit you're down kind of fight and it's just a very different tone to modern action flicks which i've actually enjoyed interesting yeah i can't say i'm i'm a big drug czar show watcher like i said it got me so i watched i watched the first one and i was like i want to know more somewhat I did Google stuff too. It's not, I didn't totally go with what I watched on TV. <laughs> I did watch some YouTube videos that talked about what they got right and wrong. Sure. All right. We don't have anything else from the chat at this point. So what do we want to talk about next? Have you watched anything else? Uh, I, well, I finished watching Arcane, 
but you haven't seen that yet. Yeah, so I, I don't want to talk I about that. Until you... Oh, no, no. Where is Young Justice in Canada? Can you watch that in Canada? Uh, Everyone told me there's a new season of Young Justice. I went and looked, and all I can find are the first two. Oh, shoot. You know what? I don't know. I'm still on the first season, so I. Yeah, I don't I, know. I, everyone was like, Young Justice. So I'm like, Am I right? Is there another season? Then I have someone else going, Oh my God, the new episode in my Twitter feed. So I'm like, It's obviously not showing where I used to watch it. Yeah. Where, I tried to um, find Young Justice, and I couldn't find it. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, and I knew the new the new He Man was out. I did enjoy the first season of Revelation. It's interesting to see what's going to happen. Um, have not watched the new Cowboy Bebop series yet. The the live action. We are currently watching the animated version because I never saw the original back in the day. And they they put that on Netflix, knowing that they got the license for the new movie. And so I want to watch the rest of the anime. And then there's a an OVA, an anime movie. I want to watch that, and then I'll do. Yeah, I, I want to watch it. I just haven't had time with other other thing I'm watching. It's definitely there. Uh, Young Justice is on HBO Max because it was canceled by the Cartoon Network. Oh, okay. So Cartoon so Network someone else picked it up. Canceled it, and HBO picked it up because HBO owns all of the Warner Brothers uh, stuff. So yeah, Deanna can talk about that one. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to watch the original in the movie before moving on to the and, and obviously this week I have not watched a lot, so I don't have a lot. It's just Wonder Woman was our break. Yeah. yeah. Um. So <laughs> that one's gonna be a bit. Uh. Plan on probably watching Hawkeye tonight, so we can't comment on that yet. Plus that one's like new enough. I don't mind. Wonder Woman eighty four has been out long enough. Yeah. Also, we were really strongly thinking of watching Sang Chi just to get a taste of a good superhero movie. Sang yeah, Chi. It, it's not without problems, of- but again, it's. It's it's like it's really good. It's again not yeah, real problems. I've, I've heard but, like second best to Black Panther, and and Marvel and you'll movies. love some of the Wuxia, uh yeah. fighting in it. Like some of the Wuxia fighting is really really good. So like I, on on a, on par with um, Flying Tiger. Uh, oh, Crouching Tiger, Crouching Hidden Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Hidden Dragon. Um, I actually just watched a YouTube video with two of the. Um, uh, they weren't the fight coordinators. They were the, uh, but they were basically sort of designing a lot of the, uh, the work around the designers. One of them was one of the cameramen who right. were, worked as a as a designer and ran camera for the things that after he helped design them, like he ran camera for the the okay. bus scene, which you, you've it's not it's, the bus scene isn't a spoiler. We've seen all the trailers. Um, I haven't seen but the, the bus. Even. The bus I don't fight. even know what it's about, but sure. Um, but you know, and again, so they've you know and they went they went through their process and how they worked with the different uh fight coordinators and doing okay. cuz a lot of um and again if, if you'd seen the trailer so it's not really a spoiler a lot of shang chi's style is based off of um a sort of a blend between J- Jackie Chan and um uh the the more a more classical uh chinese uh, martial art um you know dragon uh st- style stuff so you'll see you'll see these influences and they did a really good job yeah. of that while also bringing in these other characters who have very clearly different influences and styles and they've changed nice. up the camera work to match filming that they didn't just like do a blood sport thing where they introduced like 20 different <laughs> no, 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 or 20 no. different i'm like i don't know that was kind of a thing for a while there unfortunately the big problem is it's a marvel movie and yeah. it follows a lot of the Marvel movie tropes. Anyway, looking forward to that yeah. one. No, no, it's it again. It's a good movie. There's just a couple of things like, oh, yep, this proves that it's a Marvel movie. <laughs> you want to pass me the box up there? Sure, why not open it? Up? So the next up, we have a preview of stuff we will be reviewing in the future. Because this showed up on my porch, and I'm like, that's a board game box. <laughs> We don't we don't normally open things up during this show. This is definitely a board game box. That is a big big board game cardboard box from Amazon for those folks listening uh, no, later this isn't on. From Amazon? No, 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 no Amazon on this. And while Mo cuts that open, uh, they just started a brick and mortar waffle cafe on uh, K- uh, Kickstarter. If you want to support a waffle cafe. I don't know why you would, but you can. Uh, <laughs> that was something I was thinking about we could talk about. Chief Waffle office, Officer of Pop Goes the Waffle, an innovative waffle company. Sweet and savory waffles. I have had not I have had no luck with my savory waffles. 
My kids have we hated like them. Savory breakfast foods. But... I, I like making savory waffles, but my kids oh, have always hated thought. them. That is a, that is a lot of packaging for for what is just one game. So there is oh interesting okay so we we see what it is and uh, for those listening we have seen Charterstone which is oh not a God. small box but it's a lot smaller than the box <laughs> that it was box. shipped in. <laughs> I actually thought that was going to be a box from the op. Oh, geez. based on what I know is coming from the op. So Charterstone, we have a legacy style game. So we are going to be starting up a new legacy game with Cat Corey. This one will not be as long as the other. I think it's twelve games max. Not nah, seen on the back. I think it's twelve or fifteen. The branching path, fantasy game, building cities, and so on. I've uh, got to thank Stonemaier Games for sending this along for us to review. Been looking forward to this, hearing good things about it. So, so yeah. look for Charterstone content spread out over the next while. The Charterstone is uh, currently ranked at. Uh... The 265th strategy game with a Which solid... Which is pretty good. for, And again, yeah. that's a legacy game. That's a commitment. That's not a one and done. With a, with a solid 7.3 with 13,000 ratings. Yeah. It's supposed so, to be pretty solid. So, so Stonemaier reached out and they were like, hey, are there any of these games you want to review? And that is the one we chose out of the ones they offered. And so it is 12 games, but interestingly, well, this is... Yeah, a you can keep playing. It's a competitive legacy yes. game. Yes, Which this is, is competitive. This is not the same as as our other ones. Very and no, few. there are no current plans to live stream those games. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, your completed village will be a one of a kind worker placement game with variability. Yes. So so when you are done, you can continue to play. But uh, we nominee, will probably... nominee, nominated for like eight different awards. Yeah. Well, didn't actually win anything that year, but again, twenty seventeen was a pretty uh, busy year for games. So. Yes. Not I, I thought it was fascinating that, that Stonemaier is even looking for reviews for this. So I don't know if there's a new printing coming or it's back in print or if they just like looked and went, this is a game that doesn't have enough reviews on. Well, oh, this is interesting. This is something I don't recall ever actually seeing. Uh, there is a listed in the expansions for Charterstone. There is a fan expansion. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> it's, it's the Eternal City, a fan expansion to Charterstone. Mm-hmm. But it's listed in the official BGG All right. expansions. That, that is happens. interesting. Like, like, I remember um, Battlestar Galactica Express was listed as an official expansion. Interesting. Uh, and I'm looking, and uh, no, the 2018 is the newest printing. Yeah, like I said, I, I just, who knows? Of the game, Got yeah. the offer. It Absolutely. would have been, and the fans can let me know if I made a bad choice. We could have also have reviewed Red Rising, but that's based on a graphic novel that I've never read. So, like, I have no tie to it. Or um, Pendulum. Pendulum we talked about, but Deanna does not like real-time games. Mm. So that one kind of put that aside. There were some other offers, but it was games I already owned. So I wasn't going to review something, take a review copy of something I already own. That just seems silly. Yeah, I mean, I, Red Rising is new hotness, but... But, I, again, I don't yeah, know I don't, the license, I don't... and it looks like it's mainly for people who know the license. Like, we, we did do a bit of digging. Yeah. And then Pendulum is a real-time worker placement where your workers are timed, like our, our hourglasses, where you place them on a spot and you can't move them to a new spot until they run out or something. It looked kind of interesting, but Deanna's not a fan of real-time games, so right. we decided to pass on that one. Now, I also did sign up to review the latest Tapestry expansion, but they're only sending out 36 copies of that, and I have to assume probably 500 people applied. Right. It's going to like a rough guess on how many people <laughs> have probably applied for that. So, I don't know. Interestingly, uh, I'm actually just reading up about Red Rising because it's science fiction, so I'm intrigued at least. Uh, they actually, it got it. They tr- almost got a film, uh, a film that got canceled. They tried doing it as a television series, and that may eventually happen. There are still okay. like six different networks, all sort of uh, trying, but it's had a comic book series. Yeah, plus said, additional it's books. Light, there were novels and. So Tuari is saying Red Rising is fantasy realms with more stuff to do. So I never played fantasy realms. I know of mm-hmm. fantasy realms, but I never played it. Okay. I, like I said, uh, Pendulum, it, it was a tough choice, actually, between Pendulum and Charterstone. We basically, we got a hold of Kator and said, hey, are you guys interested in a new legacy game? And they said, oh, sure, why not? So what I'm hoping is it's something we can play that and other things. Right. It's not a take the entire night kind of thing. Fair enough. 
All right. So non-gaming question. We're going to jump back and forth here. We're going to try to equally balance. We're going to, we're going to pull a Ken and Robin, 50% gaming content, 50% non-gaming content. We're always talking about food in Windsor all the time. What kind of food is there in Hamilton? Is there anything notable? Uh, you know what? It's weird. People talk about pizza in Hamilton too. And I think they're crazy and I don't understand them because <laughs> their idea of pizza in Hamilton is this thick, gooey, um, garlic thing from the grocery store and it's like in okay. a pizza box but it's mostly it's like pizza dough with so it's like a garlic bread with toppings not even really much in the way of toppings like it's 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 way too bready um i don't understand it's it's to me it's undercooked um you don't get any any sort of crispy edges anywhere it's mm. all very very soft um and I, so i don't get that at all um, I have actually found another place I found last recently. We were talking about how I found the ramen place here mm -hmm. in town. Uh, I recently found another one called Dirty Dogs, which is a hot dog shop. Hot dogs, hot uh, dog and So, unlike the one that was in Windsor, yep. um, they actually have good hot dogs as well huh. as interesting toppings and things. <laughs> so, you're getting they're gone now. So, we, yeah, we yeah. Can bad no, I, and that's the only reason I'm actually bad mouthing this because I know they failed. Um, but that place was, I mean, they were generic. Hot yeah, they like, they were just, like red hot. Well, they weren't red hot. No, they, they were, were at least longer. Yeah, but these are like the full foot long, like ballpark style right. hot dogs. Really good. They've got um a really good um selection of buns. They have uh some also oh, different buns. Oh yeah, different absolutely nice. different buns and a ton of different topping options. Now because we're in Hamilton, they don't have the good old no uh, coney. No coney. Oh. Uh, they do they have gotta a at least have a chili. They have a dog. chili. They have a chili, but it's not. I mean, it's it's a no, chili it's dog, not, it's not a chili, dog. not coney. Um, but they've got a couple of like really spicy ones with like a bunch of different kinds of peppers on them. They do have a buffalo one because well, we're in Hamilton and we're close enough to Buffalo that everything gets buffalo. Buffalo gets buffalo is yeah. um, buffalo coal. So buffalo and it's barbecue. and they they uh, pickles are their other specialty. So like every every dog comes, they come in in boxes when you order takeout. It's a big box. Where you get the giant dog, a side of whatever kind of fries you want, fries or rings or whatever. Um, but you can also get um, deep fried pickles instead of fries. Okay. They have a little plastic thing of sliced pickles, um, and uh, and a good coleslaw. And plus, you can get sides of of deep fried pickles, and you can get full pick full size pickles. And so yeah, dirty dogs. It's a very good, very filling. The first time I ordered them, I was expecting more I, like I got mm -hmm. from Windsor. I got two, and I went, and yeah. I, I could I'm like, oh, this is a lot of food. Um, and it's not like I'm a small guy who eats small amounts. It was a lot of food. I think uh, the only thing I've ever eaten in Hamilton is breakfast food. <laughs> uh, well, we do have, a, you know, there's a, some some very good diners around. I still order, uh, I still order from the diner uh, pretty regularly. Again, I don't go in anywhere, but. Um, I stopped. I stopped off at uh, one of the pizza uh, joints I go to uh, for slice. Um, I've never actually. I don't actually get pizzas there, but I get they, they've got good slices mm -hmm. ready. Uh, and they had three tables that were open if you showed your vaccine certificate. Right. So this you know big restaurant that used to have like twelve tables in it now has three tables if you show your vaccine certificate. Uh, but and it's mostly just a takeout pizza joint. So uh, yeah, I may start. I may eat at restaurants again someday. Someday. Uh, We've done a bit. Yeah. A bit. Not, not a Well, time. and we're also getting, I mean, I, and you guys have done the patio thing uh, sometimes yes. because, but, you know, this we is have. Windsor, Windsor and, and or well, Canada in the winter now. So that's not going to be happening as much. Yeah. There are a couple of places that manage to keep patios with heater, but most of them, yeah. all gone. Plus everything's opened up whether it should be or not. So. Yeah, we'll see. The restaurants even have full capacity. They were supposed to, and that got pushed out, I think. Well, I know, the, everywhere I've been in has not been at full capacity. I, I, I saw something today about Ford uh continuing some emergency measures. Yeah, the things, emergency so. order is still in place. That yeah. that I saw. That's getting pushed out to like March twenty second. So that's yeah. gonna be around for a long time. But I think that was federal. I don't think that was well, maybe it was Ford. Maybe that's I don't know. It it's gotten to the point now where I'm just like, <laughs> what am I allowed to do and not? Yeah. I used to keep up with it. Now I can't be bothered. Um, switching switching back over to gaming, I saw Victoria today on Twitter talking about Breakout. Um, are so, are you trying to make contact? I know thing, your contact is, is gone. 
it's March. Yeah, that's it. See, Todd Crapper was talking about how he can't make it to break out this year. And then other people are like, oh, we're going to miss you, blah, blah, blah. They said this year. No, it's March 18th to 2020. It's March 18th to 20th, 2022. On, okay. uh, online sales of passes will be available in late 2021. Breakout 2022 is happening. Uh, attendance restrictions for large gatherings have been lifted, apparently, according to the provincial government. So, See, it depends. It, it, yeah, I'm just not sure if restaurants are. Capacity limitations for events have been. Oh, I can't it, it, sign up for. I can't sign up for an account yet. Darn it. <laughs> I I probably we'll see. Yeah. You know the way things are going, we could be twice as bad as last year by March next year. It's not like things are tapering off to a nice little point like they're supposed to. Things keep going up and down and up and down and up and down. So, I was planning on going to cons next year, but we will see. So the deadline to apply for media is January 31st. All right, that gives us plenty of time. Yeah. As far as I can tell, Kate's still involved based on seeing replies to Todd's post. So, the, so I should be able to just reach out to Kate. But we'll so see. The media person apparently is Pete. Pete at Breakout Con. But, yeah, I don't uh, know if I know Pete, but I, we, we know enough people at Breakout. I could probably reach out to a bunch of different people Yeah, yeah. No, to see if we could get in. Maybe they won't do it for free. We'll see. Well, I mean, they, they definitely have media badges, and I mean, there's no reason. I mean, yes. we are we are more than a year old. We can provide samples of relevant coverage. And we, we have, have been to them. Breakout Con uh, previously and can submit that coverage. Uh, we have been a pre... Uh, uh, we're not guaranteed approval if we've been there before. Uh, but, yeah, I Mandatory mean... Mandatory masking in Danielle's County. See, we never... We haven't stopped... Well, yeah, the states is very different. We haven't stopped mandatory masks. Yeah, so I so I, I, one, one, it seems like once you're inside, you you can just you know take your mask off because you will be eating at some point. Maybe at least yeah. that seems to be <laughs> the local rules, unfortunately. Yeah, but uh, the the fact that uh, everyone has to be vaccinated to me right now is enough. I don't know. We get it. It was spiked pretty bad in Ontario recently. So yeah, it was hitting. We may it, start locking down again. It, like it was a, it was over seven hundred again. I, I, yeah, I don't know what we're at right now. I haven't looked at the recent numbers. This local week, was another uh, fairly large number and another death today. And well, lots of school cases because well, we sent plate bearers door to door, yeah. unvaccinated plate bearers door to door, and no one seemed to think that was a problem at the time. Anyway, this is not what I meant to be talking <laughs> about. The depressing breakout, maybe. I uh, I would like to start going to cons again. Yeah, starting with Breakout and Origins is the main two. I would love to hit a pack next year, possibly even a um, a Wisconsin one, because mm. I know lots of people in Wisconsin. Yeah, there would be people I want to see there. Uh what is it called? A Game Hole Con. I would like to hit that, but yes. Uh, yeah, Deanna saying Breakout better let us. Yeah. Well, that is part of the reason. Wisconsin <laughs> has good cheese. Cheese and curds. It's confirmed. I still, to, don't think, I, I still don't think it's as good as Quebec. Go to Madison and check the, their cheese curds. Yep. I, I've had them. But not, not Quebec. They're not squeaky enough. Well, yeah, but did you have them in in Wisconsin? No, but someone brought them from Wisconsin that day. Oh, okay. If it was the same so, like, day. They were time. bought that morning. Oh. And and yes, they were really good cheese curds. <laughs> but they were not as good as the ones I had in, in Gatineau, Quebec. Right. Are there game cons in Quebec? We could go to Montreal. I, I, there probably are, but I would worry about language barrier at a, a Montreal game con. Yeah, no, that's definitely uh, a potential concern. So I'm sure any con there probably lists. Like, there's cons right in Detroit. Like, if, if everything was just open and normal, I had just planned to do more cons. Like, two years ago, I just planned to do more cons. Like, like let's show up at the whatever wags michigan whatever and see how big it is see if it's a real thing yep. drop our name you know drop some business cards some coasters whatever tent table tents like get our name out there and then if it's that small a con or if it's just war gaming or something we don't go back we, we show up the one time we check it out yep. yeah that's true we'll just bring the kids all right, the other thing I have on the list, which we'll go through somewhat, not like we would on Sunday, because I can't share screenshots like we do on our Sunday. So to get the full effect 
of talking about Kickstarters, I have a short list of Kickstarters that launched in the last couple of days. And the first one I want to talk about, I put a link in the chat room for those of you who want to follow along, is from Nerd Lab Games, who I've never heard of, and the game is called Mind Bug First Contact. This is a dueling card game, so it's yet another. You have a deck of cards, you're trying to fight the person on the other side, and what caught me here is that they're somehow saying it's co-designed by Richard Garfield. Interesting. So you got the maker of Magic the Gathering, and um, what's the big one we kind of got into last year? Roadbook? Uh, Key, well, no, but Key... <laughs> oh, Keyforge. The Key, Keyforge. Keyforge, which kind of did okay. I I don't know. Um, it, it's it's easy to play, they're saying, um, to complain about Keyforge. They're calling it genuinely fair. There are no randomized packs. There is no unfair advantage or pay to win. You won't lose games because of bad luck, which that one makes me wonder because if it's a deck game and you're shuffling, like that's a big claim. Um, with our unique mechanics, it's out to you to outsport your opponents. They're calling it surprisingly deep and always exciting. I need to sit through a review. There's a whole how to play here. The cards remind me of Keyforge. And it looks like it's mostly text ability. So it doesn't look like there's a strength or a dex. It's just like this card you play, it does this. This card when you play, it does that. Oh, interesting. So you only draw for, there's no deck building. It's a single deck. You're sharing a single deck. Oh, you're drawing from a single. Okay, so you're more Star Realm style then. Like like, like deck builder instead of deck construction. So there, uh, there's no unfair advantage. As players draw from the same deck and always get the chance to mind control the strongest opposing cards. In the end, it all comes down to your own decisions, making the game extremely fair and competitive at the same time. Like I, I dig the art style. I wish you guys could see it. The Explosive Toad is one of my favorite pictures. I don't know if you've, you've scrolled down to see that one. So the artist I love it. is uh, from Kiev, Ukraine, uh, Denis okay. Martinet. He has done uh, many games. So he's, done, he's worked on games such as uh, Behind the Throne, uh, all the Catacombs job. Chocolate Factory. Okay. Catacombs, uh, I can say that's the dexterity flick. Uh, Fist of Dragonstones. Um, Imperial Settlers. Three is a magic number. Many, uh, mer very uh, number of Imperial Settlers jobs. Uh, Joust in 2019. Hmm. Um, yeah, he's done. So he's got like 40 different titles. Maya. Uh, there's a bunch of, of games that are Robo City. Um, oh, yeah. Lots of art. I said I really do dig the art look. I I do like it. Um, they are doing a like if you kickstart it, you get a first contact set that's uniquely numbered. That's only going to be available not in retail, but there you will be able to get this. So you are getting kind of like a special version of the deck. Mm -hmm. I, I my biggest thing is they're claiming right in the title that it's Richard Garfield, and I can't find anything on here. Oh no, it's on. He's on the BGG page. He is okay, but game design. This is what I'm so, trying to find. So they started in 2019, just spent two years trying to create Mind Drum. And then there was testing. It was it was shown to the public at Essen. Uh so once we go through our Essen list, we should hit <laughs> this one. But like I don't see anything in here saying, like, what did Garfield do? Did he consult? Did he help design it? I, that I'm 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 still... it just it, it seems odd to throw that name out there without a big hey. The guy that designed magic helped write this. So interestingly, this uh, nerd lab got its start as a podcast. Yes. So they interviewed uh, game designers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they may well have said, you know, interviewed Garfield and, uh, and that's what that, okay. There you're saying, I was like, kind of wondering, I'm no, like, but I mean, just... if, if they interviewed Garfield and connected with him about this deck, yeah, builder, about I mean, this, deck like, builders hey, are his thing. Look at this. Uh, and connected with him and worked uh, and, and so, ended up working with him because of that connection. Hey, so the part that world. blew me away is look at the funding. It had a $7,000 Canadian goal. It's at 101000 already. Yeah. So this one's getting made. Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> and this is their first created. So for a first project, this is doing ridiculously well. Now them putting their board game geek rating is kind of lame when your game's not out yet. Well, yes, yes, it is. Who's um, played your game to give it a BGG rating of eight point four? Oh, the list of early playtesters, I would assume. I hope. Um, <laughs> I highly doubt it. 
All right, let me see if it's still at that. He's only listed as game design. He's not on the project team or illustrations or anywhere else. Um, I'm just trying, but there's no mention of what he did. He's just on the design team. So I suspect he was probably a consultant. Consulted in one way or another. Yeah, that would be my guess. Uh, but That would be my guess. So so some of the important notes here, too, is this is two-player only. Uh, weight is 2.13, so that's not, like, nothing. There are four-player rules. So why then put two-player only? Test with two if there's four-player rules. Update your board game geek listing. That's true. They did. They, oh, there was a print and play out. So there you go. There was a print and play out that people have been playing. Oh, okay. People who own it, people who've tried it. It's. It seems like it's being rated pretty well. Oh, interestingly. Oh wait, there, there it is. Okay. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure. I was trying to find the uh, trying to find the FAQ and it, the their 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 page is weirdly built. So it doesn't. Yeah. I can't click yeah, where, I, where I want to click. I want where I want to click. It doesn't actually. Can, it's, it's very bizarre. You, I have to click somewhere completely different. Okay, so the, the four-player mo- mo- rules are still in an experimental mode, and it's two teams of two. So yeah, it's okay. a two-player game still. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, well, jumping back to our other topic, I hadn't been watching the chat. So Ryan's asked, can it be great if we road-tripped out here to attend HalCon? That's possible. We were also invited to go to Saskatchewan to a game convention there. And what I asked them is, is the question my wife is, does Via Rail go to Saskatchewan? <laughs> Because that'd probably be a pretty relaxing trip. And they said, no, not via, but something else. Go uses via routes to get something. Yeah, I mean, Hal- Halifax is a 20-hour drive from Toronto. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's better than Saskatchewan. It is, true. <laughs> well, Saskatchewan, I think they said it was it was something like seven days or It's something? better in many ways because you don't have to drive through the prairies to get to yeah. <laughs> Halifax. There's actually a beautiful drive to get to Halifax. And you there don't you have go. Halifax Doesn't style have... donairs. Yeah. There you go. And they're closer. So yeah, we were invited to go to Saskatchewan, I think in May. And I'm like, May's our anniversary. Do we really want to spend our anniversary going to <laughs> Saskatchewan? And the biggest thing is the amount of time to get there and back just makes it, it's got to be like a week or two and it just cuts into so much other things. Yeah, no, absolutely. Oh, Halifax, baby. Go to Nova Scotia. I don't like fish. That's what scares me about going to out there. Yeah. But, I, can you actually go and get like burgers places? Or you, you can, like, port, but also what you need fish? to do is, and, and I, I, even if you don't like it, I will say this to everybody. Once you're out in uh, in the Halifax area, or if you go, even better, if you go further out, PEI, uh, or... PEI is have, like, real fresh lobster uh, or real fresh crab. Because see, I like crab. I, yeah, I, can see, get, I can do crab. It, it, you don't understand... <laughs> you know, Donairs have zero fish in them. I, I uh, think, I just assume everything out there is just no, but it, it, fish. Like, it is, it's really hard to explain how much better fresh crab and lobster yeah. are uh the first time i went i went out there uh with my wife we were driving um through nova scotia and we stopped one night at, at this like motel little roadside motel in this mm-hmm. tiny little town and we watched the fishing boats come in and then went to the restaurant and ate lobster like off, off the boat, the boat. <laughs> nice. like you just it's it's the, the freshness can't be beat you know it doesn't you know no, 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 flown across the country in a tank somewhere, or you know, shipped up, shipped to be across honest, the, the way things are going. I think I'd rather go to a Halifax con than one down south. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> Stay, staying in Canada for cons <laughs> may not be a bad thing for next year. Yeah, because uh, apparently I just got an. I just signed my announcements. One of the anime um, cons in maybe I think it was New York. Uh, all the all the cosplayers are warning each other because someone showed up with a fake vax certificate. Yep. So now everyone's got to yep. go get tested because <laughs> they, you know they 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 lock- going to a con is more me getting in that con is more important than all the rest of you. Yep. It's ridiculous. No. The selfishness amazes me. Yeah. No, it's crazy. Back to games. There's a new Pathfinder Kickstarter. The interesting part: it's not a role playing game. It is the first official miniature battle game from Kaizo and the Pathfinder folk that use their iconic characters. So anyone who um, is a longtime fan of Pathfinder is they have a set of standard heroes. And I, don't, I, mean, I have to assume they're like the characters that the, the, the people who designed the game played in D&D 3.5 years ago or something. 
Um, they're the same characters you're going to find in the Pathfinder Adventure card game. If you bought the Pathfinder comics, they were about these characters. Um, when you scroll down, you see the awesome looking goblin. That's Fimbus. That's the character I play when I play the Pathfinder Adventure card game. So it is using the iconic characters against Pathfinder specific monsters, like well-known ones. Their, their Chimera is a particular style that people like. It is a interesting thing here is I think they might be trying to do some Gloomhaven because it's diceless. And I got to say, if you are Paizo or whoever is, it's Yachi Uniti is producing it for Paizo and you run Pathfinder, how do you make a diceless combat system? <laughs> like, I think you're just missing your target market there. Like, by, like, like you just, you know, cast a fireball the wrong way. As far as I'm concerned, I don't get it. Like, why would you not base it on the combat system from Pathfinder in some way? So you can download the rules so you can check it out. You can look at the player cards. It's got awesome looking art. Um, they are already funded and doing, if I remember ridiculously well, yeah, you're at 197,000, only had a 71,000 goal just launched this week. So like it might've been yesterday. I have, I have zero interest in Pathfinder. Nothing to know. Yep. Don't know anything about it. It's not my thing. That's fine. But I almost want to back this because they have a character named after my daughter. And it's hard to find stuff that has her, true. her spelling and everything in it. And I'm oh, like, oh, she's she all a over character the place. sheet. That's one of the <laughs> iconics. So you, you can pick up the buy the Pathfinder Adventure card games. I know your kids <laughs> like card games. Maybe, maybe I, I I didn't I didn't realize that there, that her name was in a in Pathfinder. So that's there you go. Like I said right from the beginning that that is that is one of their iconic non-white females that they they have featured since the beginning. What I've got to say is the minis look fantastic. Like like really nice looking. I, something about the monsters, like that ogre. It's it's a female ogre. You don't tend to see that in the first place. The minotaur is nice and dynamic. There's I I don't know what they're called, but there's these super creepy alien looking things. Is there? You get a Johnny Storm miniature. That's a flaming person. Well, the super but like the blue aliens because that's like a, a ghoul. No, it's it's like this. It it I don't know how to describe it. It's like a <laughs> scorpion but fat. Oh, okay, yeah, I don't know. Oh, I see it there, yeah. But they covered up the name on it. That's an iconic, like, I've, I've only ever seen that in Pathfinder. There's an ent with the two heads, but again, it's female, which is just, you don't see female ents. No one makes them. So there's all these different tiers of monsters for you to fight. And the problem I see, and again, I, I wish I was screen sharing, is the arena looks so boring. Yeah. It's like this generic dungeon, just squares that you can rearrange and rebuild. And it just, it doesn't look exciting at all. And again, Pathfinder is kind of based on D&D. Like, give me something with a bit of a dungeon crawl feel instead of this abstract grid with some walls and colored symbols on it. Yeah. No, that's that's totally fair. I, it's doing well. Um, uh, You're looking at 140 euro for the, the core it's box. It's expensive. And then you're probably going to want to buy more heroes. And you're probably going to want to buy more monsters. And you might want some of the traps. And then there's even more stuff like the dragon is a standalone expansion you have to buy i, I don't know I, I just it seems really weird to me to not stick to more of the what makes pathfinder pathfinder yeah now i think if you'd gotten in in the first 24 hours because it is or it is past 24 hours because there were there were three special pledges for the first 24 hours uh that would have probably made it worth to go up there there were Basically, there were discount pledges yeah. for early backers, and those might have been worthwhile. But, like, if you're a Pathfinder fan, if nothing else, you get some awesome minis for your Pathfinder game. Yep. I have no idea how the game will be. Like, because the other thing is, like, there's a bunch of optional buys which aren't included in any of the dang packages. So, to get the Age of Ashes expansion, which comes with three more or two more tier one monsters, a tier two, a tier three, and a tier four, you got to spend another 35 euro. If you want the heroes expansion, but well, no, Finn those are included in the in the master pledge. Age of Ashes the, is in the on and the Age of Ashes is in the master and, okay. and the heroes expansion. Yeah, so all that, right, those expansions. If you go if you go to the hundred and sixty five euro, um, there you, you do go. get the optional uh, expansions. So you know, combat oh, is but, is yeah, card yeah, driven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The map you can actually slide tiles. So they're actually they did um, what do you call that game Magic Labyrinth? thing mm. where you slide tiles onto the map and the dungeon changes um you your stats you can level up so it's got that aspect you collect gear with your cards but it's uh, interesting so you basically you've got movement point uh, or action points and you can either move or attack or move the dungeon so you can actually right. mess with 
your own position or mess up your opponent's positions as an action in the game. Which is a very pretty interesting it's mechanic, interesting. honestly. So I don't um, know. This, this one looks interesting. This literally launched yesterday. I thought we were going to hit it in the first 24 hours. This launched it on, on day one, was on the 23rd. So like this is the new hotness for Kickstarter right now. Pathfinder miniature battle game that isn't play like Pathfinder. <laughs> I, the the last last got dice. Give me a D twenty. If I'm playing anything with the word Pathfinder on it, I kind of feel like I want a D twenty. Uh, Iconic. We... I can't say I'd be able to pick out any of them in a battle lineup. I would if you showed me a list of. I'd be like, no, nope, that's a Pathfinder iconic. That's a Pathfinder iconic. Thirty five uh, thirty five euro shipping in in uh, continental UK or continental US. That's not horrible. Uh, oh, another good news. This isn't here, but the press release came out today from. Uh, oh, we're sharing a deal. The game something. Game Zone Miniatures. Game Zone Miniatures will be the EU publisher of Hero Quest. So not only was it not a Kickstarter exclusive, which I've been arguing for a while, it will be coming to the EU, just not from Hasbro. So the new Hero Quest will be coming to the EU. Okay, this is strange. For shipping, for some reason, Estonia, Latvia, Sweden, and Canada are all the same price. Okay, sure. <laughs> Those are the ones that like we can't figure it out, so we just well, threw down there's the literally. I mean, there are like thirty five different shipping zones <laughs> wow. on this job. It's really bizarre. Like if you if you're if you and if you're unfortunate enough to end up in rest of the world, it's one hundred and two euros Ooh, shipping. Ouch. Well, at uh, least we didn't which is the same as Alaska and Hawaii. So, uh, yeah, if you're. Uh, if you don't show up on this giant list, you're paying a lot of money for shipping. And of course, the actual shipping fee will be charged, but the, the calculated and charged, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, blah. those are estimated because yeah, so, you better put estimated on your Kickstarters right now. Because otherwise, you're going to be eating, yeah. <laughs> eating so much money. A lot of people, um, like I know one, I got charged shipping and they, they said, you know, look, if you can, if you can throw a little extra in here, we're not charging the full shipping for everybody because we've, you know, we were going to have one shipping price. So mm -hmm. if you can throw a little bit into the, the tip jar when you're checking out, it would be appreciated. It would be appreciated, yeah. Just to try and even out. All right, next one, We uh, I was hoping some people from our Discord would be in here because this is, uh, I wouldn't say a hot topic, but something that we have been talking about on our Discord, which you can get access to by becoming one of our Patreon patrons at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop back at any level and we'll give you access to our private discord server where we are talking about call to adventure epic origins so call to adventure is a hybrid rpg board game storytelling game where it's kind of like a choose your own adventure story and i have to admit i have not played this game there is a group locally who love it and i would say the last three events before we hit lockdown i saw the game being played but i never got to sit down to play it it looked fascinating it looked like a good game well, this is a new addition to the game that before you play the main game, you make your character. And while the controversial part is that they are claiming you can now use this to make your D&D &D 5e characters. Which interesting. is interesting. And I don't know. I, I have no idea because I haven't played the original. There's some cool looking characters there's the, the box is fantastic the box looking. the box alone is like... but that's the 95 dollar <laughs> box like you have to buy the deluxe game with the premium accessories to get the awesome box right which actually to be honest it just looks like it's foam core it, it's it's already painted um they do have something that will give you everything which actually i gotta say 200 bucks for everything for call to adventure is a good price um so this can be its own game or you can play this first then play the other which i love the fact that you have a create a character game and then a game to play it with so similar reminds me of the game role player r-o-l-l -L, which is a game all about making D, D style characters by drafting dice which is a ton of fun but a lot of people didn't like it because at the end you, you would you have a character now what and they're like no no that was the game whoever made the best character wins and they eventually put out an expansion to fight monsters but it wasn't like a standalone game it was like a little thing you got some extra points for if you're able to defeat the monster so this seems to be taking it as the full thing and then what they've done is they're instead of the, you actually do have to involve challenges and it uses of course now their strength dex con in with charisma so it's using the modern series of sets for D, &D not the original and then 
I guess there's some way you can make a character for D&D or do background. And there's not a lot here. So um, it they includes did... a 5E compatible conversion guide. So yeah. Uh, so that's the big drive seen from people. So basically um, they've got a character sheet. It, it looks like a D&D character sheet. And all of the symbols on your cards get translated into the character sheet. The character sheet. All right. They have a, they have their own unique character sheet. So, so I don't know. I call to adventure supposed to be really good. I I'm fortunate I have not had a chance to try it. I've heard really good stuff about it. I this seems like it's going to turn what's an interesting game into a very long one. Like especially if you do want to play both. Like maybe it's if, like for a home group it's probably great. Get together one week, do this. Get together another week and do that. Now the one thing I have seen people complain about and I totally agree with is people are calling this the ultimate session zero. Oh, that was my first. And that is at the very top of the Kickstarter. It says, craft your hero, cast the runes, claim your destiny. This epic tabletop game is also the ultimate session zero for any fantasy RPG. Session zero is not rolling characters. Exactly. You Period. can roll characters during session zero, yep. but that is not what session zero is about. There is nothing in here about safety. There's nothing here about getting people on board or enthusiastic consent. So my biggest complaint about this is don't call it the ultimate session zero when it doesn't even tackle any of the session zero questions. This is create a character with some background. That's not session zero. Yeah, no, I, and that was the moment uh, it was first brought up in our uh, thing. I clicked on the link, read the heading and went, no, I hate this because yep. of that ultimate session zero statement. Just that statement. Yep. And it's their subtitle. Turns their me, carrot, turns me off huge with the way they did that. I don't know. Looks interesting, except for the fact that don't claim this is the ultimate session zero. Yep. Money Cook took care of that one. You can download it for free on their website. Absolutely. There's your ultimate session zero <laughs> tool. Yep. All right. No more. I got one more. It's called Robotopia, which I just thought was ironic because I want to mainly talk about this one. And I think it's worth it. This could lead into a whole conversation, though. It's about 1030. So I don't know how much we're going to go on. So this is yet another robot game, blah, blah, blah. It looks kind of interesting. Sorry, I'm trying to get my own link here so I can take a look at it. One to five players, you're going to compete to become the master robot. It's got some cute looking robot meeples. Hey, the board looks kind of interesting. There's obviously, I don't know if it's program movement or engine building with the cards. There's rattle reviews. There's a dual layer board, everything else. This was canceled within six hours of launching. Okay. For one, what the hell? Like, you're canceling after six hours? But wait till you hear the reason, which I'm trying to find because I know you're down somewhere. Hey, loyal Robotopians. Peter here, the owner of Bluebeard Entertainment, designer of Robotopia. This campaign isn't performing as we hoped. And at this point, it looks like it's unlikely that we'll reach our funding. Six hours in, how do you know? We know we had a great product here. The reviews have been positive. And word is that Anthony created it. The world they created is a delight, but the pricing doesn't seem to be what people are expecting. So we're going to cancel. I don't know if we'll be launched. Blah, blah, blah. Six hours. Campaign isn't performing as we hoped. At this point, it looks like it's unlikely it'll fund. How do you know? So uh, from what I can say is I look at the um, the comments. And from day one, it looks like, like very first, everyone's like, I was excited. And then I saw the price. I was excited. And then I saw the price. This looks great, but this price is crazy. So what did people back just to tell them that? I guess so. Yeah. I will say it's a $75 game for the standard edition, 99 for the deluxe, 250 for the retailer, which gives you five copies. So I, I, yeah, I'm seeing like the the European people are like it's 160 bucks to get this game. So, oh yeah, I guess they just price themselves out completely. Seems like. So yeah, too bad for Robotopia, but I just seem ridiculous. Like I I find it very strange that that people don't seem to give their thing enough time to change back. They had 212 backers. That's not a small amount. Their funding goal was really high too, though. Mm. Like they wanted sixty three thousand. You know, the other ones we talked about tonight were like eight thousand, seven thousand, <laughs> like enough yeah. to actually make a game. 
and then additional above that is to be able to ship it to the people who want it. Yeah, I, I, the, the canceling the, the, we didn't get the hype we wanted in that first day is such an issue. Yeah, and it's, it's a big thing. So, like, I, I just wonder how much is knee jerk and how much is real. And I, you know what, though, City of the Great Machine canceled really early in again because they were told their pricing was off. So they looked at, doing a bigger order and other ways to save money and then came back and killed it. So. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I, and this game, I don't man versus meeple seems to have been the ones to have, who have really sold it. Um, they obviously must have really liked it because I saw a number of comments referring to man versus meeple, um, as the sort of the reason people came to it and the reason people were excited. Okay. So yeah, clearly it's got something. But uh, it's, uh, I don't know. <sighs> Sorry. They've got uh, tons of, tons of, it was, I mean, the campaign is well crafted. I still don't understand what the game is. That's part yeah, of the problem. I was having a hard time. Like, I, I would need to go listen to the, to, or watch the, the Man vs. Meeple because I don't understand what this game is. <laughs> um, that could be a problem. I, I I've looked at the BGG link. I admit I didn't deep dive it, so. So it's a worker placement game about robots who want to rule. Each player is an ambitious robot working to usurp the master robot and take control of the factory. So you're gonna place a robot on a factory location. And the robot Man will, versus Meeple, there it is. Sorry, I thought they I was work only... on the board, but no longer belongs to you. It activates any factory spaces it touches. Uh, the bigger the robot, the more spaces it can use. And when you run out of robots, you power your generators to build more and move the master robot around the factory to crush robots into resource. It, it, it just feels messy. Like they didn't distill the game down into a clearly right uh, into a clear concept. Um, okay. And, and, and maybe Rado or, you know, Rado's uh, done a preview of it. Um, you know, there's maybe somebody has 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 done it better. Dice Tower did something on it, um, but well, they got it out to all the right people. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. I just don't understand what <laughs> what it is. So, uh, interestingly, they used the BGG forums as their design diary. They did different okay. threads each day for it. Well, that's for, a good way to get people involved early. Yeah. That part's cool. No, I think they seem really honestly, uh, you know, invested and interested that the guys done. It's not like it's one designer, you know, the only game they've ever designed. Sure. Um, this 33 games for, uh, under this designer's name. Oh uh, yeah, I guess. I, I guess if you get enough people complaining that your video game costs too much from people who are already backed, I guess, possibly at a buck. Yeah. I guess that's a good call. I just, oh, I was just shocked to see, like, deciding that soon. Yeah, I, I assume that. I, I guess it almost must be a thing where you back at a dollar so you can comment. Like, well, it a, must be on a regular. Like, like, I, I would never consider doing that. I like, it's just not for me, or it is for me. I, like, I know enough media back at a buck on everything so they can report. Right, because <laughs> you get to see all the comments. Right, that's they're funny. almost the the Kickstarter needs a you have to back at an actual reward level to be able to comment that that would be a useful thing on kickstarter yep so ryan's also saying tapped out pretty hard on kickstarter backing going to take something pretty exceptional to get me juice and i totally agree yeah and as deanna said you can back out and not that's there's zero buy-in and that's what a lot of the, the media people do it's the, the people who report on kickstarters back at a buck and they cancel their pledge by the end yeah that's fair and uh, the Daily Magic is a their Valeria, which is weird. When did Valeria launch? That was soon. That didn't come up on my list. Oh, yeah, that's right. Were three new Valeria games launched. All at oh, once, it is. which is weird. <laughs> there we go. We'll drop that down quick. We are going to take a quick look at the three new Valeria games. I should be. The thing is, these dropped while I've been busy. Uh, there's 15 days to go. I do know that one of, um, one of our friends, uh, Len, from board games and bourbon to get to check out the prototypes of all these games um these are definitely not like smaller box like they're definitely doing something different here 
they did a dice version um dice kingdoms of valeria to to go along with their card kingdoms of valeria so they did their roll and write because everyone needs a roll and write <laughs> as far as i can tell um dice rolling card drafting the art still pretty iconic um there's that one wow they, like it's weird that they grouped all these they did get a lot of reviewers which is good to see then we have siege of valeria which looks like it might be doing the nizia grid thing uh, definite dice being involved. Again, the art's really cool. There's a lot of iconic art. I think they may be re reusing art from their other games, which makes sense. Definitely reusing iconography. And then there is Thrones of Valeria, which you're, is is a card game. like a Trick-taking. Trick-taking, traditional card game. So we have a traditional card game. And the art on that, I love. It is not their standard Valeria art. It looks very unique and very stylized. And I love the look of the art in that game. Like I just want it just to check out the art. All of these are available free to play on tabletop simulators. So if you're curious about them, you can try them out. Um, the, for what look like small games, the price seems high. Uh, I'm actually really interested in, like they've done some really nice stretch goals. Uh, like the next stretch goal to hit, is all of the punched board in Valeria is upgraded to wood tokens. Oh, nice. Uh, and then the next one after that, uh, in Thrones, you get Maz Mahjong Xyle's resin house tokens and a draw bag. Like, nice. they're really doing significant upgrades with these stretch goals, which is really oh, that's nice cool. to see. That is a nice touch. Mm -hmm. So you can get the rules for all those. You can actually um, try them all on Tabletop Simulator including like trying out the demos and all that fun stuff. It's doing rather well. It had a high goal, but it's hit the goal. I good, good on them. I think is all I have to say at this point. Yeah. 30, so 30 bucks for 30 bucks for a game, I think is what we're going to start seeing yeah. as the new normal. 30, 30 bucks for a trick taking game and 30 bucks for a roll and write seems high to me. That's all. And uh, siege of Valeria, siege of Valeria's tower defense with cards coming down. Well, I right? mean, There's, you've got the option for 15 bucks. You can get as a print play. So yeah, that's true. Yeah. I to be honest, it's not even that I'm sick of, of Valeria. It's just they they put out a lot of content in a short amount of time, and I haven't kept up. And kind of because I haven't kept up, I don't feel like I need to. Yeah, you know how you just get that kind of I've fallen behind now. Not that I have. No, absolutely. I've only fallen behind on their new games, but like I haven't tried Margraves or Valeria, and then there was something about ships, ship builders of Valeria or something. I haven't tried that one either. Right. Yeah, like Ryan's saying it's comparable to Eagle Griffin's bookshelf games. I guess I just thought they would be, be simpler. It probably is a bit more than a roll and write, but that's how they're selling it. They're saying we have a trick taking game, a roll and write game, and a tower defense game. Yep. And looking at it, it definitely looks like a roll and write. Like it, it's, they show a couple different maps here, and there's little things you're going to fill in, obviously, little circles you're going to fill in. The dice just look like D6s. Like they're not, there's, there's no funky dice or anything. No, it's, it's, again, it's nice Valeria stuff, but yeah, I, the nice Valeria stuff would make sense at $25 at $30. It feels rough. And I think, it does, it and, feels I, high. and I think that's the new normal though. I think that's us that's needing to adjust to the new world we live in. Um, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, oh, there's, there's a question from the uh, chat room there. Suggestions for a good monster city building game. What do you mean monster city building? Like, is in big involved city building game? Monsters. I'm not sure what that means. Monsters. Um, Monst I don't. I don't know any games that build cities out of monsters. Or build cities for monsters. Build city monster apocalypse. The uh, new build cities, uh, the new version. Build cities Talk by about that on Sunday. Build cities by monsters. Are there any are there any games where monsters build There's cities? There's a Godzilla Tokyo Clash. Yeah, you seen the price of groceries? The end. Uh, somebody from uh, England I follow uh, posted a box of uh, Reese's Pieces breakfast cereal, yep. which I think is an utterly disgusting concept. But aside from that, it was a 328 mil, uh, um, gram box. Or, yeah. And in Canada, that box sells for four, like four ninety nine or four thirty nine. In England. <laughs> After you know, if you did the conversion to Canadian, mm -hmm. it was eleven dollars and ninety nine cents for Reese's for a, oh. the small size box wow. of Reese's Pieces cereal. <laughs> like, I actually like the oh my lord, a city for monsters. I, I, 
Hmm. Diminishing returns. We got too many questions all of a sudden. <laughs> I was about to wrap things up. City four mon. The only thing I'm thinking it is is um, Monster Apocalypse. We talked about it last week that they they've now relaunched it. It's now much simpler to put together. There is a new board game that is compatible with the old miniature game. Part of that is not only collecting the monsters and the like troops, you also collect pieces like city pieces. That's part of the game, and you paint up city pieces. That's I think Monster Apocalypse is probably your closest bet. Um, other than that, I can't think of any other cities for monsters. Probably, possibly, um, is it di- what, Dinosaur World? I mean, there's a bunch of I mean, there's a bunch of video game sort of stuff, but I don't know. Uh... There's there's Dinosaur World where um, it, it's Jurassic Park. If you consider dinosaurs monsters, um, there is the Alien and Dinosaur packs for unfair you are building a theme park and and specifically the aliens you're building it for the aliens you you are literally making the experiments for people to ride on and and gaining alien influence the theme of that one is way more dark than it seems when you start actually like looking at what the cards are and what you're doing to people that one is definitely for aliens uh, I don't um know diminishing this... returns i i know there are just off the top of my head i'm drawing a blank uh, I don't know if it actually funded. There was a there was a card game, a RAR monster building city stomping card game, but I don't know if it actually funded. That Wait, was there's back... Monsters Menace America, but that's that's more um, it's Crush Crumble Chomp more than anything else. Mm. It's 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 zoomed out. You control one monster and one faction of the military, so like the Air Force, the Army, the Marines, and then you are trying to destroy as many cities as you can. And then use your faction of the army to take out the other monsters. And at the end, it's a big battle royal. And I think it's a fantastic game until that battle royal at the end. Battle royal at the end is boring. It's just your two miniatures walk towards each other. And then you roll a bunch of dice to see who wins. And I hate that part of the game, but I love the rest of it. And I think Kator still have our copy of Monsters Menace America. Uh, So uh, Ryan's asking about uh, diminishing returns as a mechanism. Uh, Middle Earth Quest. The more Sauron uses his action, uh, the same action type, the less powerful it becomes. I, I know it's been done. Uh, I was trying in Glen Moore, the more you sell off a particular resource, the less gold you receive for it, which is also the same. We've in, definitely seen that in lots yeah, clans of, of Caledonia. Lots of economic games have that. Lots of economic games. If you, you know, as the act, yes. the more you buy of an item, the less it is worth. Yeah. Uh, clans of Caledonia is one we're playing the most yeah. right now. Every time you sell a good, the price, or every time you buy a good, the price goes up. And every time you sell a good, it goes down. Uh, power grid. The more cities you power up, the less money per city you earn. Yep. So you might not realize it, but yes, the ma- the money actually goes down. It's That's one where you just look it up on a card and it tells mm-hmm. you. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you definitely get, that uh, is definitely, th- definitely a thing in economic games. Kalis. 18xx, the more you deliver a certain good or you complete certain routes. Kalis Magna Carta. Uh, early contributions to building the castle are worth more points than later as you, as the game goes on. I could probably get you a link to Caldonia. It's back in print now. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Board game collector. Each additional game in your collection adds less net new fun. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's probably true. I said economic games is definitely a thing in economic games. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's others. But there's lots builders. where where your points go down, right? Engine builders I, with uh, yeah, uh, I'm. I am for sure uh, unfair and funfair. Hmm? Like, yeah. yes, there's a big jump when you get up to like ride number sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. But if I remember, it starts going down. Like, there's a, a perfect, and once you build, quite a few games are like get so many points for one, two, three, four, five. But then after five, it's worth less. Like, like whatever to be Fibonacci up to five, and then you just add one for each additional. Mm-hmm. See that quite often. All right, I think we're going to call it. Ryan started asking questions a little too late, I think. Because <laughs> it is 10.45. We've been doing this for about an hour. We've covered a few different Kickstarters and other stuff. And I think we will move on mainly. But I'm doing this because I'm out of coffee. And <laughs> we're going to enter the coffee break anyway, where we can keep kind of shooting the bowl. But uh, as for answering official questions, I think we're going to call it at this point, as soon as I can find my show notes, because I know I wrote up an ending. <laughs> there it is. Remember, normally we spend this segment answering one of your questions. If you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. I realize everything I just said, I should have waited 
So it wasn't in the part we cut from the show because it was good info. So this is why you should join us live or become a Patreon patron. Then you get to hear what I just said that you should have heard that you didn't or something like that. So two game nights since the last time I sat down. Yes, I've been swamped with uh, Black Friday, sale, holiday, cyber, whatever you want to call it, deals for the last little while. But before all this hit, we took a weekend off on purpose, tried to stay offline. And we part of that was a couple of gaming nights, starting with Friday with our friends Kat and Tori where we played through the Aventuria Ship of the Lost Souls short adventure. So the week previous, we had played through the long adventure, the three-act adventure of Ship of Lost Souls, and I had a great time. Um, so we're using the same characters, because our characters have, have collected some treasure and leveled up at this point. And we played through Wheatholtz's Treasure, which is the name of the sort of adventure. The weird part about that, and this is something we brought up when we did our Aventuria review that I don't think I've mentioned based on some of the other expansions, is time travel. I don't know what's with these adventures being set at different times. And it just totally breaks any suspension of disbelief. Not that there should be one in, a, in this, but it is based on RPG. So we look at it, and, we're, and it always gives you the date before the, the adventure you're about to t- take part in happened. Well, the time on this one was 40 years before the long adventure. So I didn't, maybe we should have played this first. Or, I don't know. And that part's always just kind of weird. Like, when you actually look at it, and even in the core box, the three adventures that are in the, or the four adventures in the core box are all, like, 500 years apart from each other. And I'm like, I guess they're showcasing the rich history of Aventuria, because that's the name of the world in the Dark Eye. That's why this game's called Aventuria. So, yeah, odd time travel things. So, what we decided is that it was a flashback. That this was how our characters got involved in the later adventure, because what this did is it introduced the rules for the pirate treasure, which is a big part of Ship of Lost Souls. It's, it's the new mechanic, a whole new deck of cards you get within a whole new system that wasn't in any of the Aventuria stuff. Well, you get to experience in this. And it was okay. Um, it was not many checks. There was an interesting, again, adding something new to Aventuria we've never seen before. There's a push your luck element, which I thought was really cool. And slight, very slight spoilers. Um, it makes perfect sense. But, like, the more treasure you grab, the harder your checks become because you're weighed down. So I thought that was really neat. And then, well, there's the Cursed Pirate treasure rules, which I haven't actually reviewed here. So I'm going to mention them because, again, I don't think this is a spoiler because it's in the rules section, not in the story section. You find a piece of treasure. It tells you where you found it, which is this cute little bit of flavor text. And then there's the curse. And every single piece of these pirate treasure is cursed. The curses range from annoying to absolutely horrible. And then under the curse is what you can do to break it. These range from very simple to that'll never actually happen in this adventure. If you manage to break the curse, you flip the card over and get some kick-ass ability. Why actually the abilities kind of range from okay to oh my gosh, that's almost rule breakingly awesome. But it's all based on how bad the penalty was and how hard it is to do. The big thing that matters for people playing through campaigns and why you might want to even just play this adventure is that if you uncurse a treasure, it's worth one XP at the end of the game. So you kind of, for leveling up your character, want to grab as much of that treasure you can, get it uncursed, and then get the XP for it. Now, what this does, though, is while you're playing, you now have something new to focus on. So there's like the henchman to fight, the leader to fight, the uh, who knows, whatever hero actions might be involved because we've now seen the gamut of hero actions. And then you also want to make sure you flip all your treasure. So I thought it was neat. Like it's definitely a unique, neat new mechanic. Interesting. So that's that. I the fact that they've they've given a sort of grindy XP earning option is is interesting, and I wonder if that game breaks at some point i mean so the same thing we kind of noticed with it before the 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 plus one on one of your skills really doesn't matter at all in combat and unless that skill happens to be on that hero check card right so and the most you can get is plus five to a skill and you're only going up by plus one every time you get an XP. And like the most we've now seen is three in one adventure. And that includes pirate treasure that's all been flipped. Right. So you're not getting a ton. And honestly, it's one of the things I think is good in the system. So, so there's two sides to this. 
And I'm on the side that I think it's fine. The one size your characters don't get a lot better. That leveling up really doesn't do much. Because the biggest thing is getting new cards in your thing, and that's through the reward system. And well, that's not used here. Instead, you're just getting XP. Right. And the one thing I don't like too is the pirate treasure vanishes. Like you don't get to keep the treasure. Mm -hmm. You you've done the thing, you get the XP for it, turning it in at the end. But I get it because combining this with some like say forest and a return probably could have broke it. Right. But then there's the fact that I like the fact that the player who's played more adventures character isn't now at like level 12 and now i want to play a new character and we can't play together you don't have any of that right. like yeah that guy gets a couple bonuses on some skill checks but you don't make a lot of skill checks when you're playing adventure it's a lot more of managing your encumbrance and playing your cards and making attack rolls skill checks are kind of a secondary thing in the game in the first place fair yep no that makes sense now what i will say is this adventure the the combat was it was it was boring to be honest uh, I think it's just that some of the Aventuria combats are so fascinating and so awesome. And while the other ones in the full act are amazing, like best I've seen on par with the Veil Dancer Hero Sets adventure, but in a totally different way, <laughs> this was just like, there's a lieutenant, there's a bunch of henchmen, you need to kill everything before time runs out. And it was just kind of, meh. There, oh no, you didn't have to kill everything. There, there was a time limit thing. There, there was a hero action. But now I've seen a hero action. This wasn't swing from the chandeliers. And yes, it did do something a little different. But just, it wasn't wowing. And I think mainly it was like, okay, here's a fight. The main thing you're trying to do is get that pirate treasure flipped. Right. So I think that that's what they were trying to showcase with this venture. So my end recommendation is, and basically I just reviewed the whole dang thing. I don't know if we have to do a full review <laughs> is play that first because it introduces the new pirate mechanic and kind of gets you used to it before you have to play the much more difficult three act event. Right. So that, that would be sense. my recommend. If you pick up ship of lost souls, even, even thematically, they happen chronologically in mm -hmm. order. Sorry. <laughs> Chicka fill soul. <laughs> Chick <laughs> no, we, we don't mention that word, but what the <laughs> hell auto translate? Where, where would that come from? Oh, wow. I don't even know what I said that it came up with that. Your you you your enunciation for Ship of Lost Souls was lacking like... enough that I heard it and immediately looked to see oh, okay, okay. what was coming up on the the thing because I knew it was going to say something. <laughs> Ship of Lost Souls. All right. Well, well if, uh, what happened on Friday when uh, <laughs> Kator showed up? So yeah, that's true, but well, that that was with with Kator. So later, okay. after after playing that, um, we played land versus sea, three players. Uh, wow, three players is definitely more complicated than the other two. So one of the things that's required to play three players is you have to use two of the three optional scoring, and it's strongly recommended you use all. So you are going to have to know how reefs work. You're going to have to know how caravans work, and you're going to have to be used to using waypoints before you play it with three players. Once you do play with three players, is it ever weird? So you have someone who's playing C, you have someone who's playing land. They only score completed land and C. Then you have the cartographer, who is the third person. Cartographer only scores connected reefs and mountains. So normally in the game, the mountains are scored by the... A land player and the reefs are court scored by the sea well now both of those are only scored by the cartographer then you have the standard caravan rules where when you make your first caravan by attaching either a shipping or whatever the, the the camels are called you will get two points for adding to a trade route normally at the end of the game you go how many camels are there versus how many boats and whichever has more scores so obviously the land scores the camels well if there's a tie now the cartographer gets the points the rest of the game is the same waypoints still work the same but there is no waypoint for the cartographer so land and sea are putting out waypoints whoever completes what they're on gets one point whoever surrounds them gets one point so it's kind of another way and interestingly, based on uh, talking to the designer, they said usually the cartographer will score up to 14 points just from waypoints, just from completing other players' stuff. So it's all the same, but it's not. And it's weird. And I got to say, I played the cartographer. Deanna's played the cartographer. And it's way more stuff. It just feels like there's more to watch for. So like, you're like, okay, I, I got it. Especially as a cartographer, you're like, I don't want to close off land. I don't want to close off sea. 
in general, unless I want to score the X's. But I also want to combo things. And then for the other players, they're like, well, yeah, I just want to build land, but I don't want to attach the mountains. And then the sea person's like, yeah, I just want to build lakes, but I don't want to attach the reefs. Like it just adds a level to the game that I'm not saying was unwelcome, but it just, it, it felt very different. It felt much more fiddly, even though the components and basic gameplay were the same. Right. Well, that's interesting. And it's, it's, it's odd to see a game that's that different right when you when you just change yeah. the player the player count uh by one uh and and all of a sudden the game is that notably different right and i gotta say it's really easy to forget about one of the other players like like whichever you're playing if you're playing c you're focused on c and not land or you're focused on the cartographer and you're not like one, both games so one game well, i'll get to that in a minute i forgot it's split up so in this game I was the one playing the cartographer. I forgot I mentioned Land versus you twice because I made some short notes here. Um, what I what I found was I was not paying any attention to what Land or Sea was doing. All I was focused on were the caravans and those reefs and those mountains. With the detriment of I many times helped players not by closing things off, but by limiting the exits. If that makes any sense, if you played the game, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But I'm like, you know, there's like three, six C tiles here and I'm putting down the one tile that makes it so they only need one more to close it off instead of needing two more. Right. Like I wasn't silly enough. I didn't make the, the dumb move of I'm going to close this off and give you points, but I made it much easier for them. Right. Now, next thing we tried, uh, Deanna took a bit of a break at this point. Well, she took a break earlier to, to get some work in because we are trying to get a bunch of sales out there. Um, we tried the new Galaxy truck. So first and foremost, it's Galaxy Trucker. It's still Galaxy Trucker. It is the base box of Galaxy Trucker. Um, the new 2021 edition does not have any of the new components or new aliens from the big box or another big box. You just have the core base game only. Um, you still have three ships, but they are actually different shapes. There is no optional four ship type. Now, what they have thrown in is a new learning mode. And basically, it's a learning mode specifically just to teach other players the game. That is super short and easy to teach, but really not a lot happens. So what it does is it shows off each of the different card types that you experience while you're traveling, but just has one of each. So it's like, here's some asteroids. Here's what open space does. Here's a pirate. Here's a scavenger ship. Here's some planets to land on. And here's a combat zone. I'm obviously missing two because I think it's only eight cards. When you play a full game, it is way more cards than that. So you're only getting to see eight different cards, and it's maybe half an hour. So I'm like, great for, hey, come do this con demo. Like, that's what it felt like. It felt like I did a demo at a con. Right. To me, there just wasn't enough there to ever want to play a learning game again, even though I have, because I've taught other people how to play the game. But just, I expected a little more chunk to it like i honestly like i think that probably is their con demo that maybe they start with sparsely built ships so now is it is it worth that if you've got you know new players is it is it a benefit enough to to play that uh that learning game or are you you know considering that you are a capable teacher and knowledgeable about the game already is it easier for you to just play the game and teach it so thinking about i'm going to be with tori and cat i think i probably should have jumped to a level one mission and played through a level one mission now we're going to jump back to this game when i talk about our next gaming night which was on sunday in that case i'm glad i did the learning game so i think it's going to be depending on who you're playing with if they're used to it if you are interested especially if anyone's played the original you probably can completely skip this. I don't see any reason to play through it. If you're like, oh, here's the new Galaxy Trucker, we're like, all right, let's just start on mission three or let's let's do a full campaign run or something. What I do think it's good for is anyone who has never played a real-time tile-laying build-something game, which there aren't a lot of out there, but I, th I think if someone's not familiar with those basic concepts of connecting tiles to make things match and valid and invalid connections and having to have uh, like one of the things it does is it ditches the aliens and all it does in the rule book is it tells you it's future tech we haven't figured out yet so that eliminates two of the tile types you don't have to worry about 
so it's good that way because the rules for aliens and having to attach to a habitat i have found people don't always get right away right so i i, I think it depends on how new your players are okay if they have any galaxy trucker like if they've seen the game if they watched a video you can probably skip it right okay well there you go good to know next concordia i finally got this back to the table we have talked about this game a lot it's been on multiple of our game recommendations lists over the years and i am sorry to say it had been a long time since i played my copy so every time i put it on a recommendation list i'm slightly bit of trepidation going is it as good as i remember like is it really that good well i'm happy to confirm that yes it is just as good if not better than i remember the box now, art this is was... still horrible but What's that? The box art is still horrible. Oh, but... yeah. it's it, They've improved. This is brand new box art. I have the old box art. The new art's supposed to be better. I'm not sure why. <laughs> so, first time play for Tori and Kat. And Dee's not sure. <laughs> He's like, I think I might have played this one before at, at, lo- at an event somewhere, maybe. But if it was, it was only once. So, um, one of the things they tell you to do with Concordia is the scoring in this game can be opaque and get missed so there is a thing in the game where it says so so the basics of concordia is it's a a action selection game where you have a hand of actions and they're all different like the 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 tribune and the mercator and the uh i'm totally blanking on the actual names of the card the 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 colonists or whatever and you're going to play these cards and do what it says in the card and eventually you're going to run out of cards or you might want those cards back. So you want, want to buy and sell twice. But you have a Tribune card. And when you play your Tribune card, you get all your cards back to your hand. And you make money for every card that was on the table above three. So it's a good way to make money as well. While the teaching game in this is the first time someone plays their Tribune, after they collect all your cards, you do the end game scoring. Even though you're not at the end of the game. Just to get it across. Because the way this game works is every single one of those cards lists a different Roman god at the bottom of it. And at the end of the game, you go through the six or seven Roman gods that are in it, and each score is different. So like Minerva scores based on your endgame money. You sell all your goods, and you take your coins, and you add them up, divide by ten, and get one point. And then Ares is for every colonist you have out on the board. You're going to multiply it by three. And while the game way the game works is also a deck builder, and you can get new characters. Well, by getting new characters, you can get more gods. So you can end up at the end of the game collecting six Ares cards. So you're actually going to get three times your colonist times six. And most people completely miss that and get so involved with playing Catan, like just connecting routes and building cities and expanding out, that they don't pay any attention to what actual gods they have and what they're going to actually score. So that's why this interim scoring exists. And we did it, and I think it was well worth doing because there was definitely some eye-opening moments for people that were like, oh, okay, now I get it. So I, I do still strongly recommend doing that. Um, it's up to you if you want to give the bonus points. What it does is the person who gets first in intermediate scoring gets two bucks. And the person who gets second gets a buck, which is like so, like no game of Concordia is going to be won by those $2 of that $1. So it's just a little advantage for being in the lead at that point. Game was great. Scoring is still rough like like until you played this this is a game like even with intermediate scoring you're probably going to do it wrong uh for example tory did that it did that aries thing because he got the most points in the interim scoring because he happened to have three guys out the sorry i shouldn't say guys three colonists out and he had two aries cards so he like that was a massive amount of points at the beginning of the game so he went all in all i'm going to do is collect every aries card and i'm going to collect every person which scored him a ton of points but that's all he did so he didn't diversify enough or get into something else. Like you kind of have to combine the make lots of people with the hit every continent bonus or something. Yeah. I, Game I mean, is still. Sorry. It's notable to say, I mean, it's, it's a 3.0 uh, weight, but more notable than that is it was nominated as advanced game of the year, adult game of the year, advanced finalist. Yeah. You know, like the, the, the game, the, the awards that this were up on sort of doubled down on the complexity that the weight indicates. Yeah. I agree. Now what's shocking is you were it, it's saying it's like this heavy complex game. The rule book is four pages. It, it's, it's one page two sided, like one folded sheet. 
and side, and that's it. That's a whole game because everything's on the cards. And it's actually a fairly easy game to teach, except for the importance of that scoring. At, like, getting across that, also look at the gods on the bottom of your cards. And the interesting thing is the cards you draft, it may be the same action, but be a different god. So that's another thing to watch for. Like your Mercator here might be this god, and this Mercator might be a different god. I know it's still fascinating. I still love the game. That was the one that um, we are not getting together this weekend, but I kind of wish we were just to keep playing it and have them, Tori and Kat, try it a second time now that they get it. Right. But the big thing is I am so looking forward to trying the Salsa expansion. All these people have told me, not that the original game's broken, but there are a couple resources that seem to be unbalanced and a couple of the gods that seem like if you, you go that way and no one stops you, it can be overpowering. Supposedly Salsa fixes all that. So what I did do is after a game, I broke out Salsa just to look at it. And I've got to say, no one talks about this. Besides adding a wild resource, there's a whole thing with forum tiles and cards that actually looks rather complicated. And the rules for that are 25% of the full rules for Concordia, <laughs> just for this new forum thing. So I think there's a little bit more in Salsa than most people lead on. It's interesting. I, I was just actually glancing through the listing of games that were designed by Matt Gertz, the mm -hmm. designer for uh, that. And his the, the, the lowest weight on anything of the 25 games and expansions he's done is a 2.8 on an expansion for Navigador. <laughs> so, yes. the absolute lightest thing like, of his like entire life. games. He is definitely uh, you know, up there when it comes to, to designing weightier games. Um, All right, next up, Sunday Gaming at Brenda's. Uh, started with introducing the kids to Galaxy Trucker. Um, this was weird to me because I really thought my youngest would love it. Like, she's all about STEM and robots and programming and spaceships and space and NASA. And I thought she would love this game because you're building a spaceship. Like, that's the whole point is to build the most effective spaceship and put guns on it and put thrusters on it. And make sure you have room for cargo. And she just did not. Like, we played through the learning game and then we were going to play through a second game. And she actually asked not to play the second game. Wow. And I think it's just the fact she didn't do well. Um, it's it's real time, but the learning game doesn't use a timer. But despite the fact where, like, take all the time you need, I think she just felt stressed because other people were waiting on her. And I honestly think there were tiles she didn't understand, but she felt dumb and didn't want to ask for help because she felt dumb, which we were like, no, no, just ask questions. Like, it just, we couldn't get across to her to ask for the help. So, unfortunately, that did not work out with her. Now, on the That's other right. hand, my oldest, which I had no clue if she would like it, loved it. And I honestly said, like, you are welcome to play this, but I don't know if you want to play this. It's up to you if you want to try it, because this isn't like anything else you play, because this isn't like any game I've taught either of my kids before. She loved it. Uh, my mother-in-law seemed to enjoy it. We did do the learning game, but then we also played through a level two mission. So one of the things that has changed in Galaxy Trucker is the base way to play the game now is to select a difficulty of one, two, or three and play through one flight at level one, two, or three. There are optional rules to play through all three. So the original Galaxy Trucker was build a level one ship, travel, get your reward, start from scratch, build a level two ship, travel, get your reward, then build a level three ship, travel, and get your reward. That's now an optional way to play. The basic way to play is decide if you want a level one, two, or three difficulty one and go do it. And it was different. Like we did the learning game, the level two mission, and there was a couple things. So the level two mission, you use the timer, the timer work great. I don't know if I can, I don't think they changed the rules for the timer. So the way the timer works is that at any point, someone can flip the timer to start it. And then it counts down, but you can't flip it the second time unless you're done building your ship. So as long as everyone's building, the timer never runs out, which is something I appreciate about Galaxy Trucker. But once someone is finished, you can kind of make everyone else rush, but that timer's long. Like, it's two or three minute timer. It's not like, boom, I flipped it, you got 30 seconds. Right. So the timer worked great. Um, You could peek at the cards, that part was cool. But then we did it, and you got a nice significant deck. I don't know, it, it was one level one card, two level two cards, times four. So 12 cards. You were going through 12 cards. And in the entire trip, 
of 12 cards, only two pieces of any ships were knocked off. And I don't know, did we just like have bad luck on our card? Well, good luck, I guess, on our card draws. Like, did they change the balance? Because normally Galaxy Trucker is this game where you rush and you build this ship and you try to do your best you can. And then you go for this flight and you laugh about how terrible it goes. And you 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 have to laugh about the fact that this meteor came in and blew off the one connector that happened to hold half your ship that now floats off into space. And you're constantly getting raided by pirates and losing your cargo. And you are you managed to get back with just your cargo pod and one engine on the back. And that's like a triumph. We didn't get any of that. Like literally like one little piece of my ship got blown off. And one piece of Glenn's ship got blown off on the entire trip. Now, I don't know, like if it, like maybe it was luck of the draw, but if if they did change it to make it so it's now less destructive, like if that's something new in the 2019 edition, is we made it the trip safer? I don't think I like it. That's interesting. It's like yeah, that's going to take a little more playing to sort of uh, figure out the details, I guess. Yeah, because because honestly, the fun of that game to me was always. How like pushing your luck, right? Like how close can like how little of my ship can I make it back with? And this was like we're coming back with fully formed ships. I'm like, where, where's the galaxy trucker and galaxy trucker here? So I don't know. It's it, it's going to take more plays. And what I do plan on doing at some point is a side by side comparison of the cards right. and see how did they change the actual deck mechanics in it? Because that will completely change my review of the new edition. It will no longer be. Hey, look, it's just a new edition. It's cheaper. It'll be like, hey, look, it's an edition where you're going to make way more and it's way easier to succeed. And how you build your ship isn't quite as important, which I got to admit, I could see some people asking for. I'm sure there are people out there that hate Galaxy Trucker because they're, they'd spend all this time building the ship just to have it blow up. To me, that was the fun of the game. Right. Now, the next game I played, I didn't play but watched. I kind of alluded to this earlier. I let Gwen, Deanna, and Brenda try land versus three three players. Um, again, this went well. Um, there's definitely a lot to think about with three. The AP was a little longer. Um, the most amusing part for me is I think people are going to know what I mean by this. But the problem with this game as a watcher is the same problem people have when you watch people play chess. Have you ever watched people play chess? And you're sitting there and you see the very obvious move that they should make. And you're just like, just, it's there, just do it. Yeah, that's why you should only ever watch grandmasters play chess. Yeah, because then you have no clue. <laughs> then you're then you're just going, oh my, wow, how did they, wow. Yeah, that does happen. But watching amateurs play chess, I should probably allude. It. So I was totally having that problem. I'm like, I'm sitting next to Brenda and I can see your tiles. And I'm just like, but if you put it there, you can close the thing. How are you not seeing that? And I see her turn it and turn it and then turn it the way it would fit. And I'm like, where are your eyes looking? Because it's right there. <laughs> so other than that, it played well. Um, everyone had a solid opinion of it at the end. Like I didn't do like a full interview, but I was like, what do you think? <laughs> everyone seemed to like it well enough. Um, at this point, we're pretty much ready to review it. We're, we're, I'm pretty much good to go. Um, probably would have done that today if we had more time. We'll probably co cover it next week. What I do still really want to do is play it on Tabletop Simulator with Sean. Um, probably a three-player game at least, maybe get in a couple two-player games. Probably a couple two-player games first to get used to this different ways to score. But honestly, like, just go buy this. Like, like it, it, it's the city building of Carcassonne without the fiddliness, with optional scoring levels you can stack on top that I would say bring it to a level of complexity above Carcassonne. So it's like Carcassonne light to a step above Carcassonne all in the same game plays. Honestly, we think the four player version is the most fun so far. That's what I've had the most fun playing two player works great and three, not my favorite way to play, but it works. No, well, there we go. Then finally, I have my last game of the week, which is a three player game of shadow kingdoms of Valeria. I am still enjoying this one. Brenda enjoyed it a lot, though she seemed to be a bit overwhelmed, um, especially as her first play. Now, this does use some new-to-her mechanics. Like, for how many games we have played with Brenda, I don't think she's ever played a dice-based worker placement game. So that made it a step above in complexity than I think we were expecting. Um, the surprise here, though, was that Deanna didn't enjoy it much, which she has enjoyed all previous plays. 
Now, what she had complained is she felt rudderless. She just kind of felt like she wasn't going in any particular direction. And what she was doing was just kind of rote. It was like, okay, I collect the dice. I look at what, what, what missions there are to complete. And I look at my ability, which says I get bonus red dice. So I collect the red dice and then I go complete the mission. And then I go back out on the board and I collect more red dice and then I complete the mission. And then I get more red dice and I complete the mission. In the meantime, maybe I buy a couple of heroes. Like it just felt kind of, I, like pre-planned in a way because uh, to be honest i'm i may start agree with her like the way i look at it the game may not be as replayable as i thought because mm. it's just a matter of doing the same things over and over and that you might just be doing the same core loop like and and it's as uh, Deanna is saying right in the chat now you do the thing you do the other thing yep same as when i played this last time which again if they just put it asymmetric powers i think that would have helped that um, what I do have, but that's also is, your solution for everything. So <laughs> I would definitely make it more interesting. Like, like right there, it's, it's a, look at the, how much the clans and clans of Caldonia change the game. Yep. Right, throw something like that in here, and then it wouldn't be road. It'd be like, oh, I'm playing the goblins, so I need to hoard lots of small dice. Oh, I'm playing the orcs, so I don't need like there would there's there's ways they could have done it in my opinion. Now, what I do have is I did get the Kickstarter version of this, which included an expansion. This expansion, I think, has five optional modules, and I'm starting to think those would help because they would change things up. And I got to say, this wouldn't be the first time Daily Magic Games put out a game that wasn't complete with the expansion. Like, remember Horizons, the 3X, 4X game, and then the 4X expansion you had to add to it to complete the game? So I am thinking that's definitely what might be going on here. And I'm sad to say that the Shadow Kings of Valeria, the more we play it, the uh, the less we're enjoying it. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh for me, uh one of the things we we talked we started talking about last week, just at the end of last week, was uh they added Imhotep to yep. Board Game Arena. And while it is a very true to the game <laughs> expansion, it is very obvious that we should not be playing this in our normal turn-based no. slow manner it is not a good game for that pace and it, it is of fiddly the game. like just let me click on a cube and click where to go like why does it have to give me a menu at the top and i have to choose get thing or get boat or get this like just let no. me click I don't know. Click I on my bother. quarry to get stone, or click on click on a boat, uh, one of my stone and a boat to put it on the boat. Not click on at the top, click on a stone, then click on a boat. Like it's just, I really hate how you oh. do it. Even like when you choose ship boats, you got to pick which boat and then where it's got to go. I, like I, just I, let me click on the boat and where it's got to go. Like that's how I would do it physically. I would take the boat and I would move well, here. I, it's yeah, I mean, it's the same number of moves. Your job just no, it's an extra click. No, because there's, there's at least you one don't click on you don't there. click on the boat at all. You want to click on the boat, whereas instead you just yes. click on the menu and click where you're going instead of clicking nah, on the boat. There's, there's something I'm tempted to open it up. I swear there's one <laughs> extra click in there. I don't know. I, I it hasn't that hasn't bothered me, but but playing it non real time has oh, yeah. bothered me. It's, it's just definitely like, not. Ooh, I moved a cube. Uh, and now the other interesting thing is just today, board game uh, arena as usual Wednesday is their announced mm -hmm. date announced deus uh that which is interesting and and i see i accept games from our our friend on on bga mm -hmm. all the time and most of the time it's just restarting a new game that is just finished uh so i got myself into a game of deus and i have no idea what this game is <laughs> um i don't know it's uh it's gonna be this is gonna be a quick learning curve because this is uh you know with a so so the real basic thing in that is it's a card based engine builder where you're gonna put out different cards. I think it also might be Greek gods. I think it's different names of gods, but it's you stack the same cards and every time you add a card to the row it gets better. Right. So it's all about completing sets to build an engine. Right. So like now that I have three of these, I get three of this, which keys off this that I now get two. So it's kind of like Gizmos meets concordia <laughs> which it, it's definitely got that engine building i have not played my copy in a very long time it is one of the ugliest boards i've ever seen in a board game with the, the weird ass teardrop shaped things for no reason yeah so that aren't are just bright colors for no reason yeah it'll be it'll be interesting uh again this is one i i may i may learn it uh i am finally doing better in our games of castles of burgundy 
Well, once um, you learn that you get a bonus for completing areas, that's a, that's a huge part of the scoring yeah, in that know, game. I, I learned how Not to actually perhaps the biggest part of scoring in that game. How to how to actually score. So uh, I'm finally uh, keeping up. If not, I, I was actually, I think I, at the end of the first round, I was in the lead. You guys have have since taken over, but uh, finally, and I had terrible dice rolls at the end of the last game. I am not doing enough mitigation when I play that recently. I got to start buying more yellow tiles that actually let me like plus or minus dice when I go to do stuff because yeah, yeah. I've been hurting for that. Absolutely. But yeah, that's it's solid. That that Castles of Burgundy is actually one of the most solid ones on board game arena I've played. I've been definitely enjoying our games of that. No, absolutely. And then my uh, my the the masks game I'm playing in has uh, surged up right now and it is uh, just darn enjoyable i i nice. just i'm really enjoying what preferring we're preferring playing to running yeah i am uh I, I, part of it's part of it's group things but uh you know it is what it is so i i always I still want to play again the game i was running kind of uh petered off due to in conflicting schedule issues um don't know what's going to happen with that one but the one i'm playing is uh, again surged and uh running right now uh, quite so uh, well that's all righty. Uh, so what's uh what's coming up next week? What have you got to look ahead? Right now, everything's on hold. Like like I'll be happy if we get in one game this coming week. <laughs> um, I have still been taking my turns and frequently on board game arena, but that's about it. Um, somehow, if magically there's a lull in the sales, the main thing I want to do is get some unboxings done. We just got again Charter Stone. That should be a quick one though, because I don't know how much I can show off before <laughs> without spoiling anything. I think it's a lot of sealed boxes. Um, the there there's a particular publisher that's been really pushing me to get out content, so I will probably unbox their thing just to get it done. Yeah. Other than that, yeah, I don't know gaming. <laughs> I, we'll see. I, the, there there's always a small chance there'll be a low, but probably not. Alrighty. Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Cat and Tori, we will be missing you this week. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, always awesome to see you in the chat room. Have a happy Thanksgiving. John P. Kelly of the excellent Gaming and BS podcast, now on YouTube on Monday nights. Andrew Dacey, thank you, Andrew. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at tabletop at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing, it would be awesome if you headed over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and considered tipping your bellhops, which gets acts you access, I barely speaking, gets you access to awesome things like our private Discord channel, behind the scenes audio, so you can hear the actual outtakes and not the ones we just leave in the show, stuff like our Sunday brunch and our coffee chat. And even every now and then a free game. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the Pendo Suite for the after show. And stop by on YouTube Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. I'm Mo. Thank you. And game, game on. on.